name is Dr. Amr Jori, and it is my pleasure today to present the Canadian Society of Echocardiography and JACE podcast. It's a pleasure to be here today as we start 2024 with this exciting paper. As you know, the purpose of this podcast is to highlight important papers in the Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Christina Luang, who is a clinical assistant professor at UBC. Welcome, Christina. And I also have Dr. Patty Pelika here today, who is the editor-in-chief of the journal. Patty, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to see you in the new year. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks, Patty. So the way we have uh, this formatted today is that we're going to have some special guest speakers that will present the paper, uh, and then there'll be an opportunity for some of the panelists to chime in. Um, you can also chime in with questions into the chat function, which we'll be monitoring, and then during the discussion period, we will try to address those. So Patty, I'm very glad you're here today, and I'd like to hear from you, what is your vision and what are your thoughts about the journal moving forward in this new year? Amr, thanks for organizing this journal club and thanks for asking that question. We're always trying to find ways to improve Jays and we have three things that are going on now. We have worked hard to improve the visuals of Jays and there will be more changes that come forward in 2024. We've added a central illustration and more graphics. So keep that in mind when you send us papers. We really like to see visuals. Additionally, we want to call attention to the authors that publish with us. And we've added an author spotlight, which will be featuring an author that is published in the journal. And that will be on our website. Also to call attention to our authors, we're publishing more editorials that help call attention to work and put it in clinical context. And this is besides our Echo News and our journal website, which also are ways that we can feature our authors and call more attention to the articles that are published in JACE. And finally, one thing that we've done is shorten the review time it's not a miracle, but we have managed to shave several days off the review time. And I know that um, our authors appreciate that. That's amazing, Patty. Thanks so much for sharing all of that. We look forward to being part of the journal moving forward under your leadership. So today's paper is going to be the guidelines for the evaluation of prosthetic valve function with cardiovascular imaging. This is an important paper that was written, uh, led by Dr. Zogby and it's an update uh, from the previous guideline. And when I was talking to Patty, we were trying to figure out, you know, what would be a good paper to select with for this podcast moving forward uh, as our first one. Patty, why did you suggest that this would be a good paper to start with respect to our discussion? This is really an extremely important paper there's so much that has changed in prosthetic valve imaging since the first version of this or prior version of this document was written in 2009. Um, and then there was an intermediate document on um, looking for at regurgitation of prosthetic valves and how to classify that. But since the first paper was written, the first guidelines, we now have these percutaneous valves, and also 3D echo, and CT and CMR. This paper is extremely important to clinical practice to provide guidelines about how to assess prosthetic valves that we're now seeing more and more of. And so I thought it was a, a great paper to discuss. Great, looking forward to uh, hearing more about it. So Patty, would you mind introducing our uh, panelists, Mary Anek and Philippe for us? Yes, it's my pleasure to introduce Mary Anek and Philippe that really need no introduction. Uh, they're both authorities in valvular heart disease. But Dr. Mary Anek Clavel is a professor and scientist 
at Laval University in Quebec. And Dr. Philippe Pibereau is also a professor and scientist at Laval University in Quebec. Great. That's so Mary, Annette, why don't you uh, take it away? Thanks a lot, uh, Patty, for the introduction and, and Amr uh, and for, for, for building this, this uh, podcast. That's going to be very interesting. So without further ado, we're going to start the, to introduce the paper. So um, we know that aortic valve repair or replacement is, is, is often necessary with patients with, that have uh, significant cardiac valvular heart disease. And um, <clears throat> if we often have repair that is indicated for mitral or tricuspid regurgitation, we know that uh, even there, replacement is, is quite common. And we know that for aortic stenosis, uh, we can only uh, use replacement. Echocardiography, of course, is the first line for uh, investigating uh, prosthesis val uh, valve function and is a non-invasive method. Starting first with the transthoracic approach uh, with 2D. And as, as Patty said, that we have also 3D to look at the prosthesis and then uh, transesophageal echocardiography also could be used for detailed morphologic and functional assessment. And then we have uh, other imaging tool that could be used such as uh, computed tomography and cardiac magnetic resonance that really could improve the assessment of, of, the, of the prosthetic valve. So as Patty said that this new guideline that 2024 uh, uh, look at all these, the OTE, TTE, cardiac CT, and, and, and MRI. And, and it replaced the, the previous guideline that was written in, 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 in 2009 and complement the, the part on the regurgitation that was uh, issued in, in 2019. Next slide. So we're going to start with the general uh, <clears throat> the general uh, consideration for assessing uh, pr the, the prosthesis. So uh, we we have to know which prosthesis we're going to look for because each type of prosthesis is going to have some feature that really depends on the type of the valve. Such how, here we have like uh, the mechanical valve with uh, first line with the bileaflet uh, prosthesis. Second line is the uh, single leaflet valve. And, and the, 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 the third line is the old ball cage valve. And uh, as you can see in this valve, especially the, the, um, the bileaflet and, and, and single leaflet and even, even the, 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 the cage ball, that we have some um, regurgitation that, that are observed in those valves, but, but this is normal for mechanical valve to have such a little bit of, of calcification when the valve closes. So that's why we need to know which type of valve we're looking for and what we have to look for at the echo uh, for each valve. Next slide. Then we have also a biological valve huh, with the classic stented uh, uh, valve at the first uh, line and then the self-expanding uh, transcatheter valve second line and the uh, balloon expandable uh, valve uh, transcatheter valve this, the third line. And uh, as you can see here, we could have some uh, uh, the, the arrow in the in in the area on, on the the last line we have some paravalvular regurgitation but this time this is not normal it could happen but this is not expected as it would be expected um uh, for the mechanical path so what we should look at uh, at eco what we want to assess we want to assess and and to detect the structural valve uh, dysfunction so which is an intrinsic impairment and changes to the prosthetic valve. We also could assess the non-structural valve di the dysfunction, which are uh, abnormality of the prosthesis that are not related to the valve itself, such as a prosthesis patient mismatch with a normal valve or paravalvular leak, like the leak is uh, outside of the valve, is not an issue with the valve itself. Then we have, also, uh, of course, endocarditis that, that Prevalence is between one and six percent um, and can occur any time after surgery. And we have thrombosis that we could also assess. Uh, that is, um, the, 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 the occurrence is, is between 0.3 and 8 percent, depending on the type of the valve that what we look, look, look at. So what is a prosthesis patient mismatch? So prosthesis patient mismatch occurs when actually the, the size of the valve is too small 
for the size of the patient and the, the, the requirement, the blood flow requirement of the patient. For this patient mismatch cause high transvalvular gradient, um, we measured and calculate a process patient mismatch by measuring the effective orifice area of the valve uh, index to the body surface area of the patient. It could happen in aortic or mitral prosthesis both. And uh, the, the, the impact of process patient mismatch increases with the severity of the, the mismatch. The more the, 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 the prosthesis is, is too small, the worse could be the mismatch. Finally, look, as I said, we, ha we have some physiologic regurgitation. So the mechanical valve, we may have minor jet, regurgitant jet. At the time of the, of the closing uh, of the valve, so the closing volume, um, and, and we're gonna have some, some really small uh, regurgitation at the inch of the occluders. Uh, for the bilifled valve, we often have multiple jets uh, where the, the closed leaflet meet the housing and centrally where the closed leaflet uh, meet each, 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 each other. And finally, with the stentless valve, so homograph or autograph, we may have a minor regurgitant jet, we may have very, very minor, uh, more than in stented uh, valve. For parkinson's vas, it's really rare to have central uh, jets. It's more paravalvular, but it's not normal. It, it's pathologic regurgitation, and we come to pathologic regurgitation. So when we have central regurgitation, most often seen with biologic uh, surgical valve, um, paravalvular regurgitation, so in between the valve and the uh, annulus, the native annulus of, of, the, uh, of the valve, uh, between the prosthesis, sorry, and the native annulus of the valve, um, Often it's more frequent with Parkinson's valve. Could happen also with a mechanical valve when the when the valve is less not well uh, seated in in the annulus. And uh, we use the same method to assess the 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 quantity to quantitate the the regurgitation that for a native valve. Uh, the issue is it's often is is more challenging with prosthesis than with uh, native uh, valves. So. The different, uh, we have different imaging to assess, to look at the, 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 the function and of, of the prosthesis. As you can see, uh, transthoracic echocardiography could look at everything. The two things for whom it's not the, maybe the best uh, imaging modality would be uh, the structure and the motion, especially for mechanical valve, where uh, TEE is a little bit better, but the best would be probably CT. And uh, the presence of a thrombus or panus, once again, TEE is better than TTE. So transthoracic, transesophageal is better than transthoracic echo. But once again, probably the best modality would be, um, would be CT. And uh, finally, for valve regurgitation, uh, the best modality would be probably MRI. So going to those uh, modalities, next slide, Phil, please. So you have here a CT of uh, uh, two different prostheses. Uh, so one prosthesis in A and B and, and, and the second case in, in C and D. And as you can see, if the first prosthesis in A and B works very well with a, a, a nice opening angle of the, of the by leaflets, you can see that in C that we have a, a leaflet that actually it's stuck and does not move, uh, does not open during systole. That's probably CT is, is the best uh, modality to look at that. And here we have an imaging, and we know that to quantify regurgitation, probably CMR is the, is the best modality. And with con a fast contrast uh, images that we really can quantify the, 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 the blood that goes from one side to the other of the valve and the blood that comes back in the ventricle. And then we're going to move to uh, the evaluation, the evaluation, the evaluation of processes like per se. And I'm going to let Philippe do that. Thank you so much, Marianne, for setting up the table so nicely. So, uh, for yeah, we'll cover uh, essentially. We'll have time to cover two positions, so aortic and, and mitral. Uh, but I invite you uh, to read uh, what has been proposed in this in these great guidelines. You know for. Uh, primary and tricuspid uh, position. Although they are more frequent, they are also more challenging, and uh, and the document is excellent in this regard too. So this is the um, 
the table here that is provided for the assessment of the uh, the prostic valve in the aortic position for assessment of stenosis of possible or, or significant more definite, uh, definitive stenosis. This is a very important table. Um, and you see that the parameters and criteria that you can use are listed here. There are some um, uh, semi-quantitative and, 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 uh, and, and quantitative parameters. So um, uh, the thing that are important to look at, of course, we're going to look at the peak velocity, the main gradient, uh, the AOA uh, calculated by the continuity equation, as we'll see, and the Doppler velocity index, the dimensionless index, the ratio of the VTI is very important to look at, uh, very useful, even more, I, I should say, in prostic valve than in the anti valve. Uh, and in particular, for the gradient, when you have a gradient that is higher than 20, I mean, this is suspicious for stenosis, but it could be also prosthesis patient mismatch, as, as uh, Marie and Nick has uh, told you. So there would be a differential diagnosis to do here. Uh, when you have a gradient that is more than 35, this is more uh, suspicious of a significant stenosis. For the DVI, you start to worry when it's below 0.35 and when it's below 0.25, definitely not normal. And the AOA, the AOA is more difficult to interpret because it will vary a lot depending on the model and size of prostate valve. So this is why it is so important that you know exactly the exact model and size of prosthesis that has been uh, implanted in the patient. So you can refer to tables with the normal reference values for the different model and size and compare the AOA measured in the patient versus the AOA uh, that is normal. So it's not sufficient to say, oh, it's a pericardial stented prostate valve. You need to know, is it a magna is? Is it a trifecta? Is it, you know, so to be, and what is the exact size? So you can have the normal reference value. Um, the other thing that is a new addition in these guidelines versus the one in 2009, and that is very important, uh, is uh, they included the changes in the gradients DVI and AOA in this table. Because when you measure, let's say, a high residual gradient at, um, at, the, at, the, at an echo, uh, whatever during or whenever during the, the follow up, let's say uh, you have you know, a gradient of 25, 27, um, it does not tell you much. You know, it could be, yes, it could be a stenosis, but it could be a prosthesis patient mismatch. But if you have an increase in gradient during follow-up with a concomitant decrease in AOA and DVI, then you know there is something happening with the, with the valve. So this is why you know the change in gradient is important when you have a delta of the gradient for, uh, of uh, 10 or more, this is suspicious, 20, this is more suggestive of significant stenosis. And for the AOA, this is a decrease of 0.3 centimeter squared that is suspicious, 0.6, uh, more uh, definitive. So it's very important. Uh, so this is, you know, summarizing uh, the evaluation of the hemodynamics of the aortic prostic valve. The first thing is to measure the LVOT diameter. And this is, as for native AS, the challenging measurement. This is the crux. And if you do a small error here, because it is squared in the continuity equation, this will translate into important error in the calculation of the valve area. We'll come back on this uh, during the discussion because it's an important topic. It's challenging to measure the LVOT diameter in prostate valve. Then we need to do the pulse wave Doppler in the LVOT, the continuous wave Doppler. Pulse wave Doppler also is, is maybe challenging. It is important to well locate the sample size just below the stent or the searing ring of the prosthesis, not to enter in the stent. Uh, and for continuous wave uh, Doppler uh, through the uh, uh, flow jet, well, it's... Uh, I would say, as in native AS, we recommend to do multi-window interrogation, careful multi-window interrogation. Well, this is the algorithm that is uh, uh, provided in the guidelines to uh, to to suspect stenosis uh, possible and 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 more definitive, let's say, stenosis. So the algorithm, the first uh, uh, criterion in the algorithm is the um, acceleration time. So the, the 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 time from the onset of the uh, signal on the continuous wave Doppler uh, to the peak, and uh, it is also normalized or standardized for the uh, ejection time. And if you have a ratio uh, less than 0.37, um, this uh, raise some some uh, some suspicion. Let's say uh, so. Uh, uh, well, in fact, the, the opposite. When it's less than 0.27, it's 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 fine, and more than 0.37, it's uh, suggestive of stenosis. You have to be careful with this parameter, though, because it is dependent on 
prostic valve function, but also dependent on LV function. So it has its limitation. But at least as a first pass, it is good. And then the second, and I think very important one is the DVI, the Doppler velocity index, which really, I think is the, maybe one of the most useful. When it's less than 0.25, definitely there is a, unless you did a measurement error, this is highly suggestive of stenosis. If it's between 0.29 and 0.25, well, this it's possible stenosis. More than that, 0.30, it's probably normal, but you have to be careful. You know, there is a gray zone probably between some studies suggest that the 0.35 or less than 0.35 is may not be normal. Okay. Um, so this is the table that is provided for the assessment of prostic valve regurgitation. I would say, you know, this is the same or similar parameters and criteria that we use for native valve, as uh, Marianne mentioned. Um, um, so uh, and, and, and yes, you can do quantitation, you can use the quantitative methods, but as you know, it is very challenging in, 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 in prostate valve, uh, especially when you want to quantitate paravalvular irritation, it's almost impossible. So you can try, but really you're gonna be able to do a PISA uh, or a volumetric method. So I think the parameters that are the most useful are essentially the, the width of the vena contracta, also the jet width, uh, normalized to the LVOT diameter. And um, and for paravalve regurgitation, one that is mentioned here, and that is specific to paravalve regurgitation, this is the circumferential extent of the of the leak. So when it's more than 10%, it's moderate, and more than 30, uh, it's uh, severe. And this is one of the parameters that has been the most frequently used to uh, to assess paravalve regurgitation in, in, uh, in TAVI valve. You have to be careful. Don't uh, use this parameter in isolation, you need to look at other parameters. Uh, this is the algorithm uh, for uh, the, um, and the grading of the paravalve regurgitation and transvalve regurgitation and prostic valve articular regurgitation at large. Uh, so um, uh, there are, you know, these parameters essentially again the vena contracta width, the vena contract area, the jet width, and the pressure of time and others. And if they are all in the green, let's say they are. Uh, not not very abnormal. Then you can you can do a, a, a let's say a screening, a triage, and say this is mild. On the other end, if you have this uh, on the on the far right, you have the vena contracta width that is more than 0.6 or area more than 0.30. Uh, you have a uh, a ratio of the jet to the LVOT that is more than 65. This is clearly uh, severe. Uh, so uh, you can conclude rapidly. It's more when you are in between, uh, in the gray zone that here you have to do more. Eventually, you have to do quantitation, if possible, and, and to, uh, to separate what is finally mild, what is moderate, and what is um, severe. And there is a role here, especially for the patient in the gray zone in between you know, the clearly mild versus the clearly severe for CMR, as, uh, uh, as Marie Nick mentioned. And also TEE may also provide some additional information. So this is an example of a severe uh, transvalvular AR in a plastic valve with, you see this, this uh, wide jet, um, a, a pressure of time that is very steep uh, and, um, and flow reversal also in, in, the, in the descending outer. Uh, so um, I think, you know, I will not uh, repeat what I've said, but I think um, uh, what you, you, you have to, to uh, really uh, do well is to measure the gradients, AOA, DVI is very important, the acceleration time ratio to LV ejection time. Uh, this is for valve stenosis. And this is very important to, uh, um, you know, also uh, for regurgitation, vena contracta with vena contract area uh, and the, the ratio of the jet width to the, uh, the, um, the LVOT diameter. And uh, the circumferential extent for the paravalve are your best friends, uh, let's say, to assess regurgitation. But don't forget, one of the most important things is to carefully look at the leaflets, the morphology, the mobility, also look at the perivalvular regurgitation, so uh, the, the perivalvular region in general. And, and so it's important to, uh, to see well the structure as well, to do a good structural evaluation before doing the function only. So for the mitral valves, um, as you will see, the tables are less um, exhaustive or less comprehensive, um, uh, but they capture what is really important for the, the prostic valve. For, again, for stenosis, peak jet velocity is important, maybe even more than in, uh, in 
in um, Arctic plastic valve, when you have a, a peak velocity more than 1.92, this is suspicious, 2.5, this is rather significant. And uh, mean gradient um, uh, with the cut point of five for suspicion, 10 for more definitive. The problem with the gradient in the mitral position is that it is um, uh, highly dependent on the chronotropy, the flow, and so it may vary a lot, even within a, a given patient from one echo to the other. It is very labile. So um, uh, maybe not as reliable as for the Arctic position. And again, the Doppler velocity index, the ratio of the VTI, be careful, the VTI is inverted here versus the Arctic position. So it's the VTI of the uh, mitral uh, flow across the prosthesis divided by VTI in the LVOT. So as opposed to the Arctic position, it is abnormal when it is elevated. So a value of more than 2.2, uh, suggests stenosis, 2.5 is more definitive. And this is probably um, the parameter, I think on which we should put the most weight to ev evaluate prostate valve stenosis. AOA also calculated using the continuity equation, not the pressure half time method because it is not reliable. And the pressure half time, I think the pressure of time, it's not really the value per se that is interesting, but maybe more the changes over time in a given patient that will tell you some information. Um, so this is an example here of how we can use the different uh, modalities of echo, uh, the 2D, the color Doppler, the, um, uh, the, the, the continuous wave Doppler, and the 3D echo has really a role to, for example, here to uh, visualize with this nice en face view uh, the thrombus. So either the 3D TTE or TEE are useful, especially for mitral prostate valves. So criteria for regurgitation, well, this is the same approach as for aortic. Uh, clearly, um, it's a combination of uh, qualitative, semi-quantitative, and quantitative parameter. Again, here, um, the quantitation of, MR, of the MR across prostate valve is challenging, although more feasible than the um, than the aortic prostate valve and, and probably has a, a more important role, especially for transvalvular regurgitation across the mitral valve, because the PISA is uh, fortunately uh, in the in the left ventricle, so the area that is not shadowed uh, by the prostate valve, uh, as you as uh, Marianne showed, uh, when we have a mitral valve, a mitral prostic valve in place. Uh, often it creates a shadowing over the left atrium and you may completely miss uh, the, uh, the, the regurgitation uh, because it is, it is occulted, it is masked. Uh, but if you see a PISA uh, without adjusting the Nyquist limit, this is really um, a red flag that there might be a significant regurgitation. And this is maybe probably a, uh, an indicator to do a T. Um, otherwise, the Parameters are similar to what we use for a native um, mitral uh, regurgitation. So again, the vena contractile wave is useful um, and maybe one of the most uh, useful, let's say, semi-quantitative parameter. And if you can do the uh, quantitation, which is, again, more feasible than for the Arctic, uh, don't hesitate. Um, Otherwise, the the algorithm, as uh, you know, this this algorithm that is very practical, and I uh, I think it's it's uh, something you you may eventually print and have when you do your echo or have a posture. Uh, so you you have that the if the vena contract width is less than uh, 0.3 centimeter or area 0.2 uh, centimeter square, um, uh, or you have a, you know, a Nyquist of 30, 40, or some, you know, the PISA radius is absent or less than 0.3. I mean, it, it's probably a no brainer. And you, uh, if you have, you know, two or three of these criteria, you, you know, it, it's mine. On the other hand, if you have a, a vena contractor width of more than 0.7, you know, uh, or two moderate jets, vena contractor area more than 0.4, the PISA radius that is more than one centimeter at the Nyquist limit of 30, 40, I mean, it's, then you know it's severe, you know, not much to do more. And it's more when you have, you know, uh, some criteria that qualify for mild, others for moderate or other for severe, then you have to uh, really try to do a quantitation and or, and or look at other parameters and or, again, uh, perform a TEE uh, or a, uh, the TEE that for the mitral prostic valve will really help you because you're going to be able to see really better the MR jet on the, on the left atrial side. Whereas uh, for 
Plastic aortic valve for uh, aortic regurgitation TEE may not help you because you you will have a shadowing on the uh, on the LVOT as you know from TEE. So it's it's not necessarily uh, it will help you to see better the leaflets and eventually assess prostate valve stenosis. But for prostate valve regurgitation, aortic position TEE has more limited incremental uh, value. Um, so um, yeah, I think uh, this this summarizes wh what we we uh, we just discussed. Um, again, the essential measurements for assessment of uh, and prostate valve stenosis, the peak velocity, very important, main gradient, AOA, DVI. DVI may be the one that you really want to get and report systematically. Pressure of time. Heart rate. Why heart rate? Because heart rate will influence the uh, pressure of time, the main gradient. So you want to be sure when you have, for example, you do a follow-up in a patient, if there are some changes in the main gradient or the pressure half time, uh, and the heart rate is very different, then you say, okay, I have an explanation. If the heart rate is similar, then it might really be a true changes in, in the, in the uh, prostate valve function. Um, and for um, for regurgitation, well, uh, I think it's important to, to keep in mind that you may have this issue of shadowing of the left atrium by the component of the, the prostate valve. Uh, should not be underestimated. I mean, this is a frequent, frequent that we we uh, we underestimate. We completely miss a significant MR uh, that is hidden behind the, the prostate valve. So, if you have a doubt or any red flag, um, don't hesitate to to do a TE to 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 ask for more. And um, in the case you know of the, and that's for both the um, the, the aortic and the, and the uh, mitral prostate valve when you have a grading of, uh, of the regurgitation by, by echo that is uncertain or that doesn't match or is in discordance with the symptoms or signs of heart failure, then don't hesitate to do a CMR. I mean, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, I think we should use the multimodality whenever it is, it, is, it is necessary. And I think this is one context where CMR can really be helpful for the confirmation of the uh, regurgitation severity of aortic and and, uh, and prostate valve. So thank you so much. I will uh, stop here, and um, and I think we can um, start the discussion. Thanks, Philippe. That's a, a great summary by you and Marianne. I appreciate that. So we're going to open it up to questions. We have lots of time for questions, and one of the advantages of this being a live event is that you and the audience can ask questions now while the experts are here. So please chat um, the question. There's also a Q&A. And uh, I'm going to let my co-host, uh, co Dr. Christina Luang, start off the discussion. Uh, Christina, you had a couple of questions. We'd love to hear from you. All right, thank you. Um, so again, I'd also like to thank Philippe and uh, Mary and Nick for presenting this uh, comprehensive document. Uh, it was a pretty extensive document and they did an excellent job of summarizing the aortic and mitral sections. Um, the One of the questions that I thought the audience might, uh, might benefit from is uh, around the LVOT measurement. And so as you kind of alluded to, the LVOT measurement is so important for assessing the aortic valve in general. Can you review the prosthesis specific variations in location and approach for measurement and if there's any specific rationale for the differences? Yeah, so uh, I, I, this is so important. You know, uh, I think uh, uh, this LVOT uh, measurement is really the crux in <laughs> In the calculation, you know, of the uh, of the valve area, because if you have an error in the LVOT diameter, because it is squared in the continuity equation, you're going to have a major error first in the calculation of the stroke volume in the LVOT, the valve area, and uh, the only good news is that it will not have no impact on the Doppler velocity index. And this is, I think, one of the reason we always recommend, and this is valid for native AS, but also for aortic prostate valve too look at both the, the, the valve area and the DVI, you know, because the DVI is a simplified version of the valve area and of course does not include the cross-sectional area of the LVOT. And so uh, if, if there is an error in the uh, um, LVOT diameter, you're going to have a discordance between the valve area and the DVI. And, and, and therefore, it, often, let's say, for example, I have a valve area that is uh, abnormal, uh, that is, um, you know, like, let's say 0.8 centimeter square or 0.9. So I'm worried and I'm looking at the DVI and the DVI is 0.4. Then it 
right away tells me, okay, I underestimated the alveolar diameter. I, I have to uh, revisit, you know? So it's a good, I mean, it's a good uh, safeguard. So the DVI is a safeguard, uh, if you will. Uh, so um, yeah, how to measure? Uh, so for example, I sh I've shown here two images. Uh, one here is uh, the, the left is a balloon expandable valve and the principle will be the same. Huh? Uh, but because of the morphology of the stand, the shape, the position, Okay, that may vary from one prostate valve to the other. There are some valves where it's more challenging. But the principle is for what, you know, the transcatheter valve, the surgical valves, you need to measure from the external border of the stent or here on the right, it's a, it's a, it's a bioprostate valve of the searing ring. That is, yes, sometimes difficult to see because there might be some shadowing, reverberation. But you try to be from external border to external border of the stent. You don't want to go uh, up to the um, uh, posterior or anterior aspect of the uh, LVOT tissue. So it's really, uh, and sometimes it is easier to measure in a prostate valve than in a T valve because here you have good landmarks, you know, that is the stent. So external border to external border of the stent at the really at the apical end of the stent or the searing ring. And um, uh, the issue, of course, is that in some cases, the stent, not anymore uh, nowadays, because the, the interventional cardiologists have learned how to well implant the, the, the transcatheter valve and they implant higher and higher. But when we started, you know, the TAVI, um, especially with the self-expanding, there were sometimes stand that has a very low landing zone in the LVOT. So you could be like uh, very low, so you had to uh, and, and sometimes you had a free, what I call a free hanging stent, so really a stent not really sticking with the tissue of the LVOT. And, and so in this case, it would be even more important to measure uh, from the uh, uh, external border of the stent to the external border of the stent, because anyway, the blood flow uh, can only enter within the stent, right? It cannot go around and enter by another, uh, another area, right? So, um, and just a few tips. Uh, this is just so showing again, you know, of course, it's a good image here. Huh? We will see it's a balloon expandable valve. We, we see the stent, you know, from uh, the uh, land ventricular side to the optic side. It, it is rare to have, a, to have such a beautiful image, but uh, generally, you know, you, you, you want to, to uh, measure from external border of the stent to the external border of the stent. I try to use, so the people tend to say, well, should I measure, you know, mid systole uh, uh, or, uh, or before, a little bit after. I would say for prostate valve, it is not as important that for native AS because uh, the LVOT is tented, right? Or and it is fixed. So use the frame where you see the best, the two uh, apical uh, end of the, of the stent, you know, use the front or you, where you see the best. And an, another tip I can give you uh, is that, uh, and what that's what we do in our lab. We try to use the same LVOT diameter throughout follow-up for a given patient. So we try, for example, at the 30 days echo or an echo, uh, you know, early after the uh, SAVR or TAVR, where we see well the, 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 the LVOT and the stent, we measure the LVOT diameter and we keep it constant uh, throughout follow-up because there is no reason why the LVOT post SAVR or TAVR will change, right? It is, again, it is stented, it is fixed. Um, and uh, other little uh, uh, tips and tricks here, um, because one thing that is important is, of course, to select uh, the frame, but also the plane, the imaging plane. And you want to have an imaging plane where you see, and this is for the, especially for the uh, transcaptor valve, where the, the, the 10 frames on the anterior and posterior aspect are parallel, you know, uh, and um, uh, the LV the edge of the LVOT of the and um, the, the LVOT edges of the stand frame are well imaged and they apples well uh, with the tissue. If you have a stand frame that tends to kind of, you know, it it looks like it closed down when you go into the outer, and the LVOT edges uh, of the stand frame are not well imaged um, and um, are not good at position with the tissue. Uh, that may be because you have an imaging plane that is a kind of truncated. You're not, you're not cross-secting the uh, LVOT in, at its maximal diameter. And of course, you want to, uh, to cross. You want to be on the double green arrow, not on the double red, right? Uh, and and 
remember with TTE, with this view, the parasitonogaxis view, um, the, the highest risk is to underestimate rather than overestimate. The only situation where you're gonna overestimate if you, if you take a, a measurement that is oblique. Uh, but otherwise, um, the, the trend is generally more to underestimate than to overestimate. And this is for native AS, and this is also for arteriprostic valve. And for mechanical valve that I did not show here, uh, same principle, uh, again, you're gonna try to uh, visualize the uh, sewing ring and to measure from external border to external border. Mechanical valve is a little bit more challenging because it causes more reverberation and shadowing. So you really have to uh, take several views and make sure you, 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 you are able to visualize the, um, the apical border of the sewing ring. So this is for LVOT diameter, but it, it remains challenging. So you have to do a lot and do every day, and it will be good at it. That was an excellent explanation. I, th I think it is um, also important, as these examples show, that we always use a zoomed view to try to visualize this, make this critical measurement. Uh, Philippe, yeah, you it's very important. The importance of uh, changes over time, and um, of course that assumes that you've done a nice baseline assessment after the valve was implanted. But could you comment on recommendations for doing follow-up echocardiograms in patients who have a prosthetic valve? Yes, exactly. So, and, and the, these guidelines insist on the importance uh, to have this, this baseline, this uh, starting reference point. This will be your baseline, you know, early, uh, early post saver or taver uh, when the valve is still functioning normally. And at least you know where you start from. Because for example, if you only have an echo at five year post op and you have a gradient that is ah, kind of high, you know, 27, uh, 25, and an AOA that is 1.1, 1.2, you may wonder, oh, is this a prostic valve stenosis? Uh, and if you don't have the reference point early after AVR, you cannot make the differential diagnosis between a stenosis unless the leaflets are clearly abnormal, but otherwise uh, uh, stenosis versus a mismatch. Whereas if you have the 30-day echo and you see that at the 30-day echo, the AOA was already 1.1, 1.2, and the gradient was already 25, 27, then you know it's, it's just a mismatch that is stable over time and there is no uh, acquired stenosis. So I think this this echo is very important. and um, uh, generally, the guidelines recommend to take the echo more at you know four to six weeks post intervention, because the pre discharge echo um, is often of suboptimal quality, as you know, especially following SAVER. We are post thoracotomy, and and so we are not able to well measure, for example, to well image the LVOT diameter in particular, uh, and and the hemodynamics are also a bit unsettled. So it is recommended to have the patient back for this critical, very important echo at you know, uh, four to six weeks and use it as your, your reference for, for assessing the changes during follow-up. Then after, and not all guidelines from the different societies are agree, um, but I think at least for TAVI, um, that is still a relatively new technology, um, it, it is probably recommended to do an annual echo follow-up. So you're going to have the, the one at four to six weeks, and then you're going to do an echo annually. Um, for surgical bioprostic valve, some guidelines recommend to only have echo after five years, or if there is any symptoms or signs of heart failure, of course you will do an echo. Um, so, uh, and, and yes, I think this um, assessing the changes in the gradient and valve area and DVI is probably even more important than looking at the absolute value, you know, and uh, uh, and and what you're gonna do. So you have your reference, that is the, the the time zero, if you will, and then you will see how the gradient changes or does not change ideally versus this reference echo. So and if you get to a delta of ten or more, with a concomitant decrease in AOA, because sometimes the gradient may increase just because the LV ejection fraction improve and the grid and, and the flow is improving. So this is in this case, this is not a good a bad sign that the gradient is increasing. It's just reflecting 
higher flow across the placenta. But if you have an increase in gradient with a concomitant decrease in AOA and DVI, then yes, I think it's, um, and this is what has been proposed in VARP3 initially and has been adopted by uh, the AC uh, guideline. And I think it's, it's good because this is what we do clinically. You know, we are more worried about the changes in the parameters that, you know, having a gradient of 20, 21 at any echo does not tell me anything, you know, about the, uh, the valve is functioning uh, normally or, or not. Uh, uh, but if you tell me the gradient has increased by 10 from last year, then I am worried. All right, uh, that's, uh, that's a great explanation. Um, and so I will ask a question on behalf of one of the attendees. Um, this question is about the kind of how to reconcile or consolidate um, different uh, guideline documents. So there's the AC guideline that, that we just was just published versus the VARC-3 uh, with some of the minor discrepancies. Like what would you regard as the, I guess, the priority in terms of, uh, of, of grading um, when there's differences that occur? Well, I would say, because here we are with Jace, I think we'll say OIC guys, AAC guidelines are always the best. Um, no, I think, you know, uh, what you see is that um, with the, the new edition, generally there is a, a convergence and, uh, and uh, you see, for example, the uh, ASC guidelines included the, some of the recommendation of uh, VAR3 or, you know, like the, the changes over time um, and, and use exactly the same criteria. I think, you know, the guideline committee tried to avoid as much as possible the discrepancy and the discrepancy that we see, uh, as you just mentioned, are minor. I think, you know, um, uh, guidelines are, I think, uh, should be seen as a suggestion, as a tool to help you. It's not a dictate, you know, uh, what you should do. And um, and I think, you know, if there is discrepancy, they are often minor and they're often for one parameter or one criteria, but all the other criteria and parameter are very well aligned. The main difference in terms of regurgitation uh, uh, assessment of is more in the assessment of regurgitation, especially paravalve regurgitation between VARC3 and the ASC. The ASC has a kind of a three class grading, you know, mild, moderate, severe, um, whereas the uh, VARC3 has a more granular. So we have uh, the mild has been divided into mild, mild to moderate, and moderate into moderate and moderate to severe. So there are five classes. Um, uh, but you can easily uh, go from one to the other. You just have, you know, VAR3, you put mild and mild to moderate together, and you have the mild from ASC in the same form moderate. And remember, um, for clinical management, it's the ASC or uh, ASC VI or ASC uh, ACC guidelines that you have to follow because VAR3. Is a um, is more standard a standardized definition for research purposes. It's not meant to be uh, for clinical management. That's why we use a more granular uh, scale for for regurgitation because for research you may be interested to have more granularity, but it will not change the clinical management. So for clinical management, I think we go with mild, moderate, severe. Oh, that's great. Um, we'll see if there's any other questions in the chat here. I think. Yeah, I think uh, Mo uh, is. I don't know if that's Dr. Rashid. You had a question. Is your microphone um, still working? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. A question. There's uh, some discussion out there about uh, for LVOT measurement about gauging it based on the uh, valve size that was put in. Uh, I know it's a bit of a debatable and gray area. What's your thought on? on that as to gauge the LVOT diameter to put in for the measurement post uh, valve implantation. So it's very bad um, uh, <laughs> to do that. No. <laughs> yeah, so, and I will let, uh, I will let Mariani comment on the use of CT. Yeah, we, that's also we another have to keep in mind, yeah, that the, the, the 23, 25, 26 are the size uh, provided by the, 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 the producer of the valve. But when you you take um, something to measure really the, the the size of the valve, the twenty five is never twenty five millimeters. Uh, it could be twenty four point five for certain valve. It could be twenty five point five for for others. So um, 
it's not because it's a 25 at size that is 25 millimeter in diameter. So don't use don't use the size of the valve as the as the diameter of the LVOT because, as I said, it depends of the 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 the, the size the the type of the valve you use. Uh, it could be 25, but it could be even 24 for certain valve, and uh, and 26 for others. Yeah. So um, so uh, more than 30 years ago, in Jace, I published a paper with Jean Duménil. And this was a, a, a paper of my PhD thesis, and it was exactly about that. Can we use the label size of the surgical prosthesis, the, the, the Taviva were not existing at the time, as a substitute for the uh, LVOT measurement? That would be so much easier. But indeed, you cannot, because as, as Marianic mentioned, you know, the, the, the label size for surgical valve does not correspond to the exact actual size. And the problem is it may vary from one company to the other. And with the TAVI valve, it's even worse because a given size, uh, depending on whether it is more or less expanded, may correspond to different uh, diameter of the uh, uh, of the ability of the patient. So no, unfortunately, you cannot do this a simple way. Sorry. You'd better use the DVI. Don't get rid of well, yeah, then the LVOT you, diameter and right. just use the DVI. That would be better than, than using the, the size of sure. the of sure. the prosthesis. I agree with that completely. Um, I think we we always make these measurements in our laboratory and make them very carefully and don't assume that the prosthesis is is the size that was on the label. However, yeah, the we, Mayo Clinic has published um, uh, another paper. Uh, confirming the same thing, you know, that we cannot use the uh, VOT diameter. And also we cannot use, uh, and it's interesting because we also published and the Mayo Clinic also published on, you cannot use the pressure of time to calculate the mitral valve area. You know, it's it's not reliable. You have to use the continuity equation when you want to do the mitral valve area. But again, here, probably DVI is the best for the mitral valve too. Include on our imaging reports, the size and type of prosthesis, as well as the implant date, which I think can be just useful information for um, clinically following the patient and, and also for knowing you know, the likelihood of, of degeneration having occurred in the bioprosthesis. Yeah. So important, yes. Absolutely, okay, and I agree. Uh, I have another question that, uh, that anyone in the panelists can, can answer, but um, is there a general approach that you would recommend for kind of integration of CT and MRI or TE in patients who have kind of an almost unexpected increase in gradient on, you know, on your routine, if you're doing a repeat echo and the gradients changed in the last, since the last echo, but the patient's not really manifesting any symptoms that are worrisome enough for you. Do you have a general approach in terms of when you actually integrate some of these other advanced imaging or, or, or would you just do general repeat T transthoracic? And is there a difference between the, you know, the type of valve that they have in place? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, when there is some changes in gradients, you know, that, um, that may not necessarily meet the criteria, you know, that we just uh, mentioned, but you have some increase, you know, in gradients and some decrease in valve area, or you you don't, you know, the leaflets look not like pristine, you know, all these type of red flags, uh, uh, or the patient has some symptoms that, you know, new and set of symptoms that are not very well explained. I think this is where we do not hesitate to, uh, uh, to do additional modality. And typically here, um, that would be, um, uh, sometimes it's a TE first, uh, and uh, the, otherwise a CT angel, but it's going to be a CT with contrast here, of course, mm -hmm. and we're going to want to see if there is any halt, you know, this uh, lipoattenuated uh, leaflet thickening or reduced leaflet motion. Reduced, reduced leaflet motion requires more extensive, uh, I mean, for the CT, it's a little bit more complicated, and uh, uh, Mariani could discuss that, but... Um, this is typically, so if there is any red flag, you know, symptoms, heart failure, or changing gradients, or leaflets that look like thickened, and with not much imaging, uh, one of the changes, we, we typically are going to do a, yes, a, a TE and or a CT, um, uh, CT angel, uh, especially, you know, uh, now with the TAVI, we know that there is a quite high proportion, well, uh, on average, 15%, but it could from 10 to 30% of patients who are going to have a subclinical leaflet thrombosis, you know, uh, 
uh, and and some of course have clinically significant thrombosis and so mm-hmm. and we may want of course to identify those patients and in in order to be able to treat them with uh, anticoagulation yes, absolutely and uh, marie any any comments um no that's wonderful thank you guys for this discussion we're uh, coming to the end of the hour and i really appreciate the insights from Marianak and Philippe and uh, Christina and Patty. Um, I'd like to mention that uh, I'm certainly going to go back and listen to this uh, podcast again. It's going to be available on the American Society of Echo YouTube channel. Um, It's also going to be available on the Canadian Society of Echocardiography website. There's a lot of rich learning here. So uh, I want to go back and listen to this, and I'm going to read the paper. Patty, can you remind us where the paper is, in what issue? Yes, thanks for bringing that up. The paper is published in JACE in January of this year, but I'd like to remind everyone that all ASC guidelines are free access for anyone, anywhere, regardless of your membership. We want to um, provide these as a service. Amazing. So a couple of uh, quick announcements and then we'll get to the best part. Um, So CSE Echo Weekend coming up April 19th, 2024. Registration is open. Please go to the website. ASE June 14th of this year as well. Two great conferences uh, coming up. So just a plug for that. And then for the final segment, I really like to bring in some steam, some um, art into this uh, opportunity. It helps us learn a little bit about uh, Marianek and Philippe. So Marianek, what uh, art would you like to share with us in these final few moments of the podcast? Um, this is a tiger that's called uh, Blue and Gold. It's a younger artist, a, a street artist, actually. Um, I'd like to find a wall that he paints, but this, this is not a wall. This is really a, a, a painting he, he did, like last year. And um, yeah, I really like a young uh, uh, street artist, uh, I think. Oh, okay. Is this, I have uh, very a... difficulty to, to choose the one that I, I, I really prefer, but I, I like a lot of what he did. Oh, that's amazing. Is, and is this a street artist in, um, from what, from where is the person from? Uh, he's from France. Uh, he's oh, a okay. French street artist. Uh, started really as a street artist. Maybe not completely legal like the beginning, but now it, now it is. <laughs> Okay. Very nice. Amazing. Yeah, it really gives us insight into um, your your spirit animal, I think. And uh, your your determination is, is what I see in this picture. So thank you for sharing that. Great. Uh, and Philippe, your turn. Uh, yes. So uh, this is a, a painting from uh, Johan Miro. Uh, that was done in uh, 1925. This is a dancer, supposed to be a dancer. I I think you'll recognize the head uh, and then the body and the legs. Uh, I like, first I like very much Johan Miro, uh, you know, the the colors that he uses, like this ultra marine. Um, And this one is, uh, I would say, uh, kind of uh, unusual for Johan Miro. It's uh, less, uh, let's say, less dense. This is probably one of the sparsest uh, uh, painting he has done, but maybe also one of the most uh, poetic. And also I chose this one because there are many that I like, you know, on Johan Miro, because there was a heart uh, Mm -hmm. that is the body of the dancer. And uh, maybe, I don't know here, but maybe there is, it seems to be a lesion or... Or a scar, so maybe this heart underwent a transapical uh, uh, tower eventually. That's what was my hypothesis. So amazing! Yeah, this is this is one of my favorite painter and 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 uh, and painting from this painter. Thank you, Philippe. I I remember when you shared your painting at the last last podcast as well. That's what's up for Cezanne. Yeah, and you you provided so much rich description, and you saw patterns that other people don't see. And, and I can see why you're so good at echocardiography. Uh, you take that same sort of approach to the visual richness in front of you. So um, it's yeah, do quite- Yeah, you see uh, the colors? The colors also are um, uh, very, um, maybe this is another reason why I like this painting. It's m- more or less the color that we see in the pizza, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, you have all the colors and, and it's also similar to, I, I see that with Marie-Annick, we like the same type of, uh, 
of uh, of colors you know very uh very intense in the blues and uh, yeah indeed yeah great well thank you so much for sharing that aspect thanks to the audience for joining us uh it's been lovely to have the jason podcast uh in collaboration with the Canadian society of choreography back again so please stay tuned for further episodes in the future thanks everyone bye